Good everybody. We're going to start a couple minutes early. Um, we'll have plenty of time. Um, my name's Steve Lang. Uh, I work at Act. Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, I forgot about that. Great. Um, I'm going to talk about Python in the video game industry, which people may or may not. I six months. Ago, I didn't know how much Python was used. I've been a big fan of Python for a long time, and uh, ended up at Activision and found out that um, there's lots of opportunities there. Um, but well, there's really three things I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about in general. I'm going to talk a little bit about the team I'm on and some of the challenges we're facing. We're kind of ramping up uh, a data analytics team. And then I'll just show kind of a case study of one of the things we've built out and talk a little bit about uh, the tools we use and, and what we do. And you can kind of see a little bit into the data and the kinds of things that we, we do. Um, uh, just a little bit of background about the company. Activision Blizzard is the parent company. I work for Activision Publishing, which is the Activision side of it. Um, they merged in 2007, I think. Activision has been around since 1979. A lot of people don't realize it. it was the first third-party game developer in terms. In other words, the first company that built games, not but they also built. And they're, they're actually Activision Blizzard's still the largest independent game developer. I said they merged with Blizzard Entertainment. That's World of Warcraft, Diablo, Starcraft. Over 6,000 employees and revenue last year of four and a half billion dollars. So, uh, one of the largest entertainment companies in the world, and just outside the Fortune 500. So, Activision Publishing. I just these are the three big games that um, I'm kind of involved with. Ghosts or Call of Duty. This year's title is called Ghosts. Uh, Skylanders is another big game. People, don't, if you have kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about, and you hate me because your kids buy all these old Skylanders toys and. Is our new big game coming out? Really, a partnership with Bungie Studio. Um, they stopped making Halo 2010 and have been working on Destiny since, and it's the most anticipated new game, I guess, of all time. But so I even did a little investigation, like you know, how do people use gaming? In you know, first thing that comes to mind is can I build video games with Python and like them? And, that would be very um, The way the video games work is that there's a core engine. Uh, there's, there's commercial ones like Unreal and uh, Unity. Um, we have proprietary ones. And then people that. Um, again, Lua is a big common scripting language people have heard of, but a lot, a lot of times that's proprietary too. So that's kind of the way video games work, scripting and an engine. And you'd say, well, why don't you script with Python? The answer is you probably should. It's probably a good idea, but people haven't really. Uh, maybe just historical. I don't know why, but there are a few exceptions to that, and I found some. I, I knew about Eve Online, but um, there's a few other companies that actually do use uh, Python as the scripting. I guess uh, I missed the talk this morning on Pi Game, Pi Game, and Panda 3D are a little, but it's still sort of Python driving an underlying. API, but for for real, uh, you, you typically don't Python actually use to build the game. I throw in I threw in Maya here. Maya is, is a tool people use to design characters and objects, uh, and then those models that you use in the game they use Python in that. But it's also the actual game. But that said, um, Python is used really quite a bit at different studios. Uh, I got this information from one of our studios, Treyarch. Um, they, there's a whole list here. They have Python for uh, almost everything outside of the core game itself. So they do all the building, uh, all kinds of testing with Python, uh, and even some sort of analytics that they do in, in QA and information they collect online. So um, lots and lots of Python use. Uh, I do have up here another example. We have a company called Demonware um, that actually does our data warehousing and runs all the online play. And I'll talk a little bit about Demonware, but they, they too use Python very, very extensively for everything. Move, um, move from different solutions much more towards Python. So it might be surprising, but it's, it's used all over the place um, 
in game studios. Uh, I'm on this, it's a fairly new team called the Game Analytics Team, and that's what I want to talk about. We're like a brand new team that uh, a year ago there were maybe four people, and now we're up to like 20, I think. But um, we're kind of going through growing pains of trying to uh, herd together people that are data scientists and real, uh, a, a lot of people with physics back grounds actually, but not like necessarily programmers. Some of us are. I'm, I'm, I'm less on the data scientist side, but um, we're trying to build out some best practices. That's why I use that in the title because um, that's really what we see as an important thing at this stage of the development of our group. Uh, I want to just get a little background about how, how these studios work. So Activision buys up studios a lot of times. Uh, Infinity Ward, Treyarch, uh, Raven, High Moon. They, they buy those over time, uh, but they have this independent studio model where they let those studios run their own show. They have their own cultures. Um, they do things the way they want to. Um, toys for Bob, I guess all the workstations are Tiki Huts. So if they want to do that, they can do that. But, uh, and then they spin up some of their own studios like Sledgehammer and Beachhead. Uh, and so uh, th these are studios. I work for Central Studios, which basically services all of these. So we have like common resources like uh, Performance Capture Studio, a stage. We just actually opened the, the most advanced performance capture stage, I guess, in the world, um, which is pretty cool. But so we service these, and so they, they all kind of are like separate companies. So it's like we're doing consulting for them in terms of like helping. Them out. Um, that's sort of the way things feel. So what do we do? Um, as a company, Activision, of course, we call it the CRM analytics or sort of marketing sales analytics, analytics to support the executives and so forth. They, like any company, they, they have a team that does that. Uh, our team actually is to work for the studios as customers and to help them out in different ways. So the main thing is we want to improve the games. That's our goal. Um, uh, we, we've been involved in a lot of different things, but some of the examples are like finding people that are cheating. I'll have a little example of that. Um, game balance could be things like balancing or the maps in the games, sort of optimizing those and studying those. Uh, churn's a big thing. You know, we don't want people uh, leaving games because they're frustrated and not having a good time. It's really important that people have a good time at it. Uh, the studios did, always did a lot of this themselves, but they never had the resources. Uh, typical studios are maybe two or three hundred people, but that still isn't enough resource to do really heavy duty uh, data analysis and things like that. So uh, a shared resource allows us to do more. The data we get, um, game telemetry. So you play an online, it's, a lot of what we do is, has to do with the multiplayer online games. So at the end of a match, a lot of information goes up, and that's all stored, and we can analyze it. Uh, lot, lots of different people analyze that for different reasons. But we get data from things like sports tickets from We've done internal surveys even to find out what maps people like. Social media, we, we've had a little project where we scrape social media and do some natural language processing on that to try to understand how people feel about the games. So there, there, there's a lot of different data sources we can use. This one is the game tel telemetry. Uh, there's three parts to this team, and this is where it kind of gets interesting because I'm in analytic services, the middle one. We, um, Core Insights is a team uh, that does sort of ad hoc analysis. They're like consultants. The studios come with them with a question. Uh, they want an answer within a few days, a few weeks. Usually a team of one or two or three sometimes more, but usually a fairly small team works on it, and they deliver them a report or something. So that's really sort of, like I say, ad hoc analysis to answer a question. Uh, I'm on the analytic services side, which is more like building production kinds of code. Um, so that's you know more, more traditional um, sorts of development thing, goals. But we cross over quite a bit, and that's kind of the, some of the difficulty we have figuring out how we need to do things. Instrumentation of games I won't talk so much about, but that's how making choices of what data to uh, actually upload as part of the, um, at the end of these games. And we're involved a lot in that. But, but so it, it's really, that's 
the, the really the reason for this talk is, the, is that we have these two groups and they are different and, we're and they have different needs. Um, we use lots of Python packages um, and as you would probably expect and I'm, I'm not going to go through all this stuff but we also use a lot of other tools. That's the important thing. We, this, because some studios being independent, a lot of them use Python heavily but some of them use C Sharp and uh, they've written things in Java and other languages we might need to interface with or share code with. So yeah, we're thrown in with you know Java C dot net. Um, data scientists like to use R programming quite a bit, so that's that's pretty big. Um, there's a history of using Tableau dashboards in the company, uh, which we still support a lot of. Uh, some uh, web sorts of tools. Um, uh, tracking. There's, there's just like lots and lots of pieces to this. So lots of Python tools, lots of other tools, and then we have the data. I mentioned Daemonware, so uh, our main data source is this Greenplum database, which is a distributed Postgres with Hadoop on the back end. Um, um, they provide us, you know, SQL access to the database to query, and then they also create these JSON endpoints so that we can uh, different people, a lot of studios use this a lot, can actually query data directly from that. And they're collecting about a terabyte of data a day for maybe one title. <laughs> so it's quite a bit and it's growing quite, quite rapidly. They don't store that data, but it, lots of, it gets processed down, but actually we do and t tens of millions of player match records. Many, many, many games are played every day. So all of this, because of our teams, we wanted to like think about best practices in how we start doing things right off the bat. That's, and we're still kind of struggling. So you know maybe we'll have somebody else come back and talk about some more things later in a year, and see where we're at. Uh, I'll, I'll break this down. So two sides of things: ad hoc analysis. So these are people who are typically used to do researchers. Uh, um, actually, a lot of PhD physicists, for some reason, we're not sure why, but uh, they're not so used to doing like uh, code development and sort of practices that uh, people like us that do that are used to. But when they do do work, the, the two of the important things that have to happen are reproducibility and version, and I call it version control. I'll describe that. But reproducibility means don't just save that report that you gave to somebody. You have to be able to go back and recreate it. Uh, at some point later in time, or more likely rerun it with newer data. So, you know, you can't, you have to carefully manage all those assets that went around creating some report. Um, and that means actually a re reproducible, executable environment, because you've got to be able to run it. Uh, easiest example is we, we're still Python, Python 2.7. If we go to 3.0, we might have a lot of problems. So, being able to reproduce the environments and all the assets that were used to create that report are important. And I throw in version control. Versioning isn't so important when you just have somebody working for you know, a week or two on a project, but uh, really managing those assets and being able to search them, be able to, to find those things that you need, that, that becomes important. So it's not just saving them, but it's being able to find them again. Um, so a couple of things we found that, that we think are good solutions. Um, and you know, I've known about these for a long time, but we have a lot of R programmers. I won't talk about the R side of things, but on the Python side, IPython notebooks are just great for this kind of work. Uh, if, if people are familiar with IPython notebooks, and you, you basically have your code, you can put text in, in there in these notebooks. All the results are there, charts and, and tables, whatever you want all saved as a single sort of file resource that you can easily save off. And then when you pull up a notebook again, you know, you can rerun it immediately, um, provided you have the same Python and all configured right. Um, we're actually doing something with this right now. Um, my boss has put together uh, an IPython notebook that he, sh that he has put up onto uh, a notebook server that's shared with one of the studios so that they can go look at some analysis he did, uh, and it isn't just a chart. They can actually look at the data, they can look at uh, the code, they can see his descriptions, they can see the output, and if they want, they can actually modify things and sort of do what ifs and change things and rerun it on the fly. And they don't need anything installed, it's in a web browser, so that's pretty sweet. Um, 
So notebooks are really, really a good thing for these kinds of ad hoc analysis. We've got other tools, but uh, I point that out on the Python side that that's really great. Um, in terms of managing the environments, we've kind of settled on Anaconda servers. Um, we actually don't have it completely rolled out yet because we were waiting on getting one of our servers set up, but um, we're going to use Anaconda server, um, or in general, anyone that uses Anaconda and the conda command can do a lot of this stuff. But the sort of the commercial Anaconda server, what it gives you is sort of this local repository. They use this bin star. They let you run that locally so we could create our own Python packages and do conda install on them for our own very proprietary sorts of things that we might develop. Uh, the other big thing about Anaconda server is is just for Python. You can have versions of R in there. You can have lots and lots of other languages and pieces of things um, that uh, you can set up as an Anaconda environment. So what that means is that if, like I said, if we run, want to rerun some old report, we can spin up an Anaconda environment that will match exactly what we need to run it again. Uh, and so all of this stuff is very desktop-y. You know, this is people doing analysis on their desktops. Um, and we thought a little bit about one good point. We thought about like storing and managing those assets from these uh, ad hoc analysis. Uh, you think about Git, it's like, no, we have many, many, many little repos we'd have to create for all these little investigations. Um, Git isn't so much about letting me find things, but I'd have to know. I don't want to go through a bunch of repos to try to find something. I'm not sure what I'm looking for. We use uh, JIRA for our uh, project management, uh, creating JIRA tickets for requests that come from studios. And you can put attachments on there. And we've had some success with using that, but that's really not ideal for storing lots and lots of things. Um, then we stumbled on Perforce Commons. Uh, Perforce is a source con another source control uh, tool that actually some of the studios use. It seems to be pretty popular. Um, and they have this product, though, called Commons, which is just like, they call them spaces, but you're just setting up a directory, if you will, that you can dr drop something into your space. And you can drop any you know, binary or code file or anything you want in these. Um, and of course, backed up on a server. Every time you drop a new file in, it's automatically versioned for you. So it's pretty powerful. Uh, you can do access control, so you can collaborate with people with these spaces. Uh, and for us, one of the biggest things is you can search it. So you can search across all of the spaces. It'll search in the Word files, in the Excel files. It'll search everywhere, um, which is good if you know, you've done hundreds of little investigations and you don't know which one you're looking for, but you kind of know it involved a technique or data that you'd like to search on. So again, not so formal for these kinds of investigations, but common seems like it, you know, it gives you kind of the best of... of uh, a good practice of backing up things and versioning things without you know, using something like Git, um, which would probably not be the best choice for them. So the anal analytic services side, that's my side. Um, we're still a really small, tight team, but um, we're kind of divided. Uh, this is very much more formal uh, development, the normal configuration management, source code control, documentation, testing. First thing, it's like good practice to like think about all these things and actually do them. So, and that's pretty hard. Uh, testing's always the hardest for us. But, um, so what do we have? We have PCs and Macs that we use for our individual development machines. We, we have some production servers, but we're not like big DevOps distributed and analytics. We have our demonware company that usually does most of the heavy lifting. We're not sure if it'll always be that way, but right now um, they do the heavy list lifting, and we might have some standalone, fairly hefty servers, but we're not going to be doing distributed stuff right at this moment. Um, so we, but we do have production servers. We're thinking Anaconda server is going to work for us there, too. Um, um, people don't want to spin up uh, VMs, Vagrant, or something just to do desktop work. Um, Anaconda server lets us, new guy comes on board, uh, you can't just have him go, you know, uh, conda install or pip install a million things because now he's got all the newer versions that you don't have and you'll never ever be in sync and we've had problems with that. We've had problems with that with R too because it has lots of packages. And when you do things that way, it's virtually impossible to have two environments that are the same. 
and so stuff doesn't work sometimes. But Anaconda Server, you can spin up um, an, an environment. It's just a local install of everything that you need and all the right versions of R and, and Python and everything else. Um, we've talked about Ansible and um, that works with Docker, that works with Vagrant. If, if we get into the distributed space, um, the, Ansible's a Python tool. So um, we'd probably like to do something simple. We're not doing big we're not doing the big data stuff ourselves. We have a small audience. We have, might have fair amounts of data, but um, we're not thinking um, the big IT kind of stuff that our demonware uh, company does. So, you know, I'm sure no one would agree with me on these, but they, these are some of the decisions we've made to run with, uh, and hopefully it's gonna work for us. Um, we use Jira, which is Atlassian. They have this stash, which is just Git. And it does some other things, I guess, but I just use the old git commands like, like anybody would. So basically use git for source code control. Um, we, we're using Sphinx to do uh, documentation. So we can sort of package the documentation up with the source code, and then we can use NumPy doc to uh, auto-generate the documentation for things like APIs. Uh, so that combination and you know, restructured text everywhere. It, it's a nice, easy way to, to create, uh, to, to auto-generate documentation for things we build. Uh, any internal docs we have, we'll just store in Git. Uh, and I've you know, testing. I've used PyUnit, and I like that, but we're, we, we haven't really sort of figured out what, what that means for us, because Um, so that was kind of short. That was sort of the best practices, um, such as they are today. And I'm sure that'll change because we're going to be needing to add a lot more things. So I'll talk a little bit about um, one project we did. You know, what what does the data look like? What do we actually do with it? And how do we build something around that? Um, and when we say cheating in video games. There's some things that people consider cheating. It, it, it's really a social thing. Some things, spawn trapping, isn't considered necessarily cheating in one game, but is in another. But there are cer certain kinds of things that you can do in games that are clearly cheating. Uh, people hack the consoles and, and actually go into the code and change things where they can get unbelievable scores, and that, that's cheating. But we had one issue called boosting that uh, happens a lot in first-person shooter games. In our case, it's uh, Call of Duty Ghosts. Uh, was where we did the work for that. And you don't care so much about cheating, a lot of people complain about it because they're like, they're playing the game and it's like they're cheating and they have a bad experience and they don't you know, want to play anymore. So it's, it's important to us. It's one of the biggest, biggest issues that, that uh, consistently comes up. And <laughs> favorite guy. And I have an instructional video to explain exactly what boosting is. Here we go. So we're in Call of Duty, and I'm looking, I'm seeing someone, an opponent, come at me, um, and we aren't shooting at each other, strangely. I'm just standing there, and I let him shoot me. Really doesn't make any sense, and if you're playing the game, you see somebody do this. Uh, wait, this back to me now. I'm running back, I have a knife, which is not very effective. Um, Strangely, I run back to the same spot where I'm still lying there. And uh, my daughter helped me put this together. This is not live. Nobody was actually hurt <laughs> in a video game. <laughs> she runs out again and, oh yeah, she's got the light machine gun. That would be the, and with the, with the rocket launcher or the grenade launcher underneath. And, and she has shot me again. And I did not defend myself. So that's sort of the, so what's going on here? It's like, you, you basically up the rank by killing people or accomplishing other goals, and there's various things you can do. I'm helping this person by letting them score lots and lots of kills. Um, and I, actually, it turns out you, you don't actually like lose points for being shot. You gain points by shooting. So, I'm great. But... Um, so boosting is a collaborative collaboration, what we call the booster and the, the collaborator. 
they go in the game together and they just shoot each other, you know, during the entire match. Uh, sometimes you'll have multiple boosters just spending an afternoon doing this to get lots and lots of points. So, so how do you stop that? In the past, they'd actually like try to like look for these people that could actually play back games and try and find them. It's very, very hard, and you know, millions and millions of played a day uh, that you can easily do by hand. So uh, a little background. So, so a bunch of work went in. A number of people did some investigations into looking at the data and trying to identify uh, if we could find boosters in the data. Um, and we have quite a bit of data on these matches that are played. So we know, um, well, everything about you, what, you, what weapons you have, where you were standing when you got shot or shot somebody, uh, what you had in your hand, what direction you're facing, where you were on the map, lots and lots of things. So they, they actually came up with some, um, an algorithm that would identify or score a person in a match and say, is he a booster, he or she a booster or not? Um, and actually conversely, is some other person a boostee, someone collaborating with them? Uh, so, um, uh, it's a very complicated model, and I don't understand it all. This was uh, developed by some of our data scientists, and uh, they basically came up with an algorithm that would very reliably find boosters uh, uh, and, and implement that. That algorithm actually runs every night on every match that's played that day uh, on every person in every match. So uh, it's a pretty big computation. In the end, we, we get information on who these likely boosters and they're, they're kind of they're they're scored so we know above cert, a certain level we're fairly certain that they're uh, boosting we're absolutely certain uh, above some levels uh, and so the studios want to know this information it's up to them to do something with this it's not our choice do they want to ban these people do they want to send them an email do they want to punish them in some way that's entirely up to them but as a service what we did is we put together some uh, JSON endpoints so that uh, they can basically in their own code, and uh, at least one studio, Infinity Ward, has their own application that uh, processes different kinds of cheating, and this is one form of cheating where they can just pull the, the information from our, uh, our endpoint. Um, and so that's one way of, of providing data um, or the information to them. The other way is to actually build a, a user interface. And so we took those endpoints and built a little uh, interface around it so that you can actually drill into the information and um, and, and uh, uh, interactively which um, they're, they're not so much using that I mean once they pr productize it they really just want the JSON endpoints but sometimes I want to do this just to explain to people what's going on um, I'll, I'll show this the, the, the couple screens of this and I'll describe how it's all put together but this is PyGal for instance I, I was told at a point that PyGal is pretty cool it's a little library that creates uh, SVG files with a couple lines of code in Python. It creates an SVG file for you, but it's all it's all very interactive and tool tips and everything. And uh, it, it's not super super for what it does. It does very well, very easily, but maybe not as configurable as other tools in Python. But we're using D3, and we'll use whatever we need to use, I guess. So I don't know, this is an example of an interface where a user at the top with some background information on, on the user and then a whole bunch of matches where they've boosted and, and their, their scores on these are 0.98 which we know anything above like 0.95 is almost certainly a booster. We know uh, you know what game type, platform, a lot, a lot of information about them. If you click on one of the, we set up, so if you click on one of these it actually brings up the map in the game that you were playing. In other words when you play these multiplayer games, you're like in uh, you know uh, one particular area that that you're playing with a bunch of other players that uh, defines your world. Um, and we you can't see it on there. I can zoom in. We're actually plotting um, the booster and his collaborator. So anytime this booster shot the collaborator, we're showing where they were standing. And the yellow line over, well, the green is the booster and the red is the collaborator. Really bright red is a headshot, which is kind of another sign of boosting. If you're, somebody keeps running up to you and you keep shooting them in the head, that's, uh, the, the algorithm that's being used uses many, many, many variables 
which together um, uh, pretty much guarantee that we've found a booster. So you don't really need to look at this because we trust the algorithm, but some people like to see what sort of what does it look like in the game? Um, uh, how does the behavior play out? Um, so that's Matplotlib. <laughs> um, so how, is this, how does this work? Uh, when you play a game on your console, um, sometimes your console ends up being the server, we call a listen server, and sometimes you get a dedicated server. Hopefully more often you get a dedicated server because you spend a great, great deal of money setting up lots of dedicated servers around the world. But a bunch of people play together uh, on this A server, and at the end of the match, uh, information gets set up to our uh, our green plum database, the, the Hadoop side of it, uh, it gets stored there, um, sort of raw binary. Um, that gets proce processed and parsed out into tables, um, I believe that's overnight, uh, into the Postgres side of things, uh, this distributed Postgres. We nightly run our boosting detection algorithm um, on that, score every person in every game, and the ones that are like above some level, we, we create a, a booster table of, of uh, people that we think are boosting, at least from what, some level on up. Uh, that's sort of all batch. Uh, and then we built this, we call it a rest, rest dish API. I call this almost a microservice because we're not doing any, you know, you, you can't update anything. You're just querying, uh, doing simple queries really of, of the information. And we used, Bottle, Beaker, Cherry Pie, LDAP authentication. Use CryptoJS for a while to, to encrypt the password, usernames, passwords. Uh, Pandas and PsychoPG2, which is the Postgres driver. I mentioned PyGal, Map, well, Map for that web app, Matplotlib, Twiggy for logging, and SQL. So we ended up using a lot of different pieces. All that won't be enough for some time for the, the number of people actually using this and hitting it. Um, and then we built the web app on top of that um, that I showed you. Uh, and that's kind of the theme we think we're going to use for a lot of things. It's like always build endpoints and then if we need to provide something else, build that on top of it because then people can always, if they just want to consume the data with their own code, they can do it that way as well. Um, and if we built it that way, that's that will always be available to them. Um, and documentation. So very nice documentation. So went to a lot of trouble with Sphinx to like uh, put the doc uh, resources or assets in with the code so that some nice documentation like this can be generated. Uh, and then as part of generating this uh, in the, there's like doc strings in the code itself, uh, using NumPy doc, we're able to, NumPy doc, I guess, is it'll let you uh, format things a little nicer in the code than uh, uh, just using Sphinx by itself. But, and we even um, extended it a little bit to add a new section called side effects, so we could always have a little side effects section in the documentation. So this, this is showing you the generated doc. And, uh, and if you have Sphinx, it's nice because you can generate PDFs or HTML or anything you want out of um, out of your, for your docs, so however you want to sort of share those. But again, it's, it's a best practice practice because you want to be you want to be doing those things. You want to make sure you're doing good documentation, API documentation, and everything else, documenting your development. Um, those are all things that we can't let slip by. Oh, I just had one gratuitous piece of code in here to throw in. It's kind of a a, a shout out to decorators. Um, if you've ever used Bottle, uh, this is a little trick that we wanted to just show. It's just so just because Python's so awesome and easy. So you have these route statements in, in uh, Bottle that says login, username, password goes to this piece of code. A couple lines of code, we do the LDAP authentication. Um, we grab the using Beaker, we grab the session and put that the fact that they're authenticated this is fine for us, in, into a cookie uh, for this session and save that off. And um, I'm not going to go through extensively all the code, but and then we have another um, 
another function called authenticate that simply just goes into that beaker session and says, are they authenticated? Um, and then the beauty is, is the guy here where now for all our endpoints, we just put add authenticate and it will feed that through that. And if they aren't authenticated, they go to a, you got a login screen or something. Uh, uh, so decorators in Python are just kind of cool. I actually all, all the years had to use them a lot, um, but I was doing different sorts of scientific engineering things with Python and had not used that. Um, and then I have one gratuitous fun thing, another gratuitous fun thing, which is um, when I showed you that map of what a, a match looked like with, uh, in this case, boosters and boosties plotted on it, we started thinking, what else can we do with this? And um, we decided it'd be interesting to look at one player in the match actually playing a game uh, and all of the kills that they got are all the times they were killed. We might do something with this one of these days. So, and it's cool because it's matplotlib again, but every time you see like a little flash, that's a kill taking place sort of in speeded up time. Um, uh, we're actually, the green is showing, uh, well, green and red are the people on the two different teams in this case, and the color of the line in between them shows which side did the shooting, uh, did the killing. Um, and it actually has like even the position of the player, which direction they were facing when it occurred. Uh, I think we know that too. So we can go through a whole match. Uh, we put a little spark line at the top, which is plotting all of the the kills on either on either team throughout the entire match, which kind of shows you the pace of th things going on. Um, it was kind of for fun just to see if we could do this, and um, something like this might be useful because it's, it's kind of pretty cool. If you play these games and you could like look at your match like this and study what went on and where people were and what was happening, uh, that would be very, very cool to know. Is this a booster game or not? This is not a booster game. Um, yeah, because uh, well, those typically, real typical booster games, <laughs> two guys standing next to each other. It's like boom, boom, boom. And they play this infected. Well, actually, I can... We have plenty of time. Well, it's funny to listen to this guy. You need oh, come back. <laughs> Somebody very unhappy is. He's. This is going to be more typical boosting. Um, <laughs> people really hate people that, that boost. Sorry, there's a lot of cussing going on, but luckily it's bleeped out. This is the report down to this kind of going on in college. Those guys little trophy system know what's his boyfriend hacking. But I get it. Now you got it. Now what's his name? Those one up. Just in a second here, they'll show what happens. Typically, is you can actually put a marker down that says, "When I die, I will respawn in the same spot." So, and there's one mode in Call of Duty Ghosts that still allows that, and they do this in a second. He's, he's really, really unhappy. But, oh, here we go. So, well, the green light is tactical spawning. So, he comes back to life in exactly the same spot. His friend is going to come over and knife him. And he'll come immediately back to life. And his friend will knife him again. <laughs> and, and so, this is a typical booster map. They're just standing next to each other, shooting each other constantly. Um, and that's why the, the actual map, the, the, uh, the map, <laughs> this guy just goes on, I, I picked this one, just, the guy's hilarious, but, um, so I even picked, showed you like the boosting looked like, that was actually a low boosting score, it may or may not have, probably was boosting because of all the factors involved, but most of the ones we see look like this, where they're just like right on top of each other. There's two guys, maybe two other guys somewhere else in the game doing the same thing. 
uh, and they'll do this till they rank up. Um, you know, they'll do nothing else in the match. Sometimes it happens in the middle of a bigger match with other people playing, but a lot of times they just like set it up to do it. <laughs> okay, he just he gets extremely happy. <laughs> um, bad. And we know people, and uh, that's sort of the end of my talk. And did I mention we're hiring? So we're we're looking for data scientists in. Uh, as my boss says, it's like we're not in Silicon Valley, we're in Silicon Beach, which is Santa Monica, which actually I guess they call it that. And now they're starting to call Boulder, Colorado. That's where I'm out of uh, Silicon Mountain, <laughs> which is cool. So we have, we have a team now of four uh, in, in Boulder, part of our teams in Santa Monica. And a few are actually scattered around in Canada and the Bay Area. But um, questions? I have a lot of questions. Okay. <laughs> I used to bop World of Warcraft. And I used to bot um, Eve extensively. So yeah. Eve is actually mostly written in Python. Um, the C++ is just, it's glued right into the Python. So there's only a couple of DLLs that are in C, and then the rest is Python. So you can actually decompile Eve and play Eve. Oh, OK. It will like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can decompile it and play it in Python, which I've done. Oh, cool. Well, I, I, I thought there was still like a rendering engine that underneath I mean. it. Yeah, the rendering engine, but it's very small. I mean, when you look at the total... Size. Oh, exactly. You know, I believe it. Well, actually, look at any video game, and these engines, although they, they do a lot of work from title to title, they kind of stay the same. We have this yeah. IW engine. And you're right, the amount of work that goes on that from game to game is very small. It's, it's all this scripting. Yeah, so this, I, I just pointed out, because you said it's scripting, and it's like, yeah, it's scripting, but it's literally everything. You know, everything that, yeah. the, all the UI is scripted, all of the, you know, all of it's scripted, so. And th that's actually true of all, all video games. Uh, but they don't use Python, you know, I mean, and I think it's because of uh, historical yeah, reasons. Yeah, I, I think it's completely historical. I think a lot of the, and also, the culture of, of how engines are developed and, and the division of labor within the game company, I think that uh, it's just yeah, it's a historic thing. Well, it's really good. I know they, they EVE Online, they, they have, that's the biggest game that I've heard of that uses Python that yeah. extensively. And I think they made a really good choice of Python. <laughs> yeah. so but but this, you, go so ahead. I think in these sorts of cases, like this, uh, this um, Call of Duty Ghost, like I also, um, I used to, my brother used to be a very active Counter-Strike player, and so I learned a lot about Counter-Strike cheating. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in my opinion, like a game like, um, it's tricky, because in a game like WoW, I think, I, I, I can talk about this later, but I think it, uh, most of the cheating in WoW can be stopped. It's pretty easy to detect on the server side and could be stopped in real time. Uh, in a game like this, I don't, with these, this boosting example, like you said, some people call it cheating, some people don't. But if you think about how the game was actually designed, like they didn't care that people could do this when they designed the game, right? No, they, they did care. They do care. Um, it's it's making use of. I mean, any first-person shooter, it's like you come back to life. It's really actually this is this is a hard thing to really prevent. We actually are talking about like real-time in-game cheat detection. There's some of that that goes on. And we're talking about doing more of it, and so I think more could be done. But people, people find like little holes, and, and again, some some things aren't cheating. I know there's, uh, I don't remember which, it probably was, it wasn't even ghosts. In one of the games, there's this. Everyone like spawned, and they threw a grenade over this wall, and they never could see what was on the other side of the wall. But like statistically, chant like 60% of the time you'd kill somebody. So <laughs> everyone learned to throw a grenade over the wall. That's probably not cheating. I, but I think this boosting example is interesting to me because it, uh, if you think about the game theory perspective, right, the, the incentives are, are off, right? The, the person who designed the game did not realize that there was an incentive for people to basically not play the game while playing the game. Right. So I see that uh, in a lot of games, um, like the vast majority of games, like 90% of the games. Um, and I, I think your job is really fascinating because really if they had someone who was doing analysis when they were making the game and they just had like a hacker right. who was just sitting on the team and was like, oh, I just, I just spammed grenades and won the game, like then they could... Yeah, so, so, so part, part of it is there's a lot to be said for it. It's up, a lot up to the game designers to like do a good job. There's no question of that. And like I say, they do some analytics, but... Uh, 
I mean, we're using like random forests to do some of this analysis and really involve stuff. And the studios never just don't have people or the data or the know-how to, to develop analytics around more complicated things. So this is like, this, this ends up being something that's like a lot harder to like tease out of the data than a lot simpler things, which they do try very much to like find cheaters in. So uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it's a constant battle. And sometimes cheating isn't considered, it isn't really bad if it doesn't hurt anybody. If it makes people unhappy, it makes them not want to play the games, then, then it's an issue. If you went and did something and you got a higher score and nobody else cares, so that doesn't really hurt anything. It's only when it, it's, it's an issue when uh, it touches on somebody. Yeah? So uh, uh, just uh, two uh, things. One very briefly, um, if you're doing the matplotlib visualizations using new versions, there's an XKCD mode. Um, it makes everything into like hand-drawn sketches. It would be really mm. awesome. <laughs> oh. Okay. Um, the other one Look at is that. Uh, related to ease. Um, in addition to the Python uh, side of that, there's also the cheat detection side. But in ease, um, the client side uh, cheats, they're, they're not as much of an issue as they are in a first-person shooter. But what it does have is a persistent economy. So um, that's one thing that I found very interesting. They actually have an in-house economist uh, that's CCP. And when someone g does uh, something with that, you know, their account is frozen, um, they do some kind of scam, they actually have the ability to go look at all the economic transactions and follow them back so they can figure out who got money that they weren't supposed to have and reverse all of those transactions. Mm -hmm. So it's the same kind of like cheap detection, but there's yeah. actually something they can remedy in response to it. Yeah, and actually I saw a talk uh, from them on the in-game policing, which goes on, and, and, and which is, is actually how, you know, well, if you know the game, that um, if you're in the outer fringes, there's a few police in the center, there's lots. But how they designed that went very, very badly uh, through like two or three iterations before they started to get it right. They really had a lot of trouble with that. And that, that's just, you know, part of the game, but it still was not working right where it was very unfair. And I made a lot of disc off of it. It was great. The, the what? I made a lot of disc off of it. It was great. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so supposedly they fixed some of that. Um, What's the hardest problem you're working on right now? Uh, well, we're working on a number of pretty hard problems. Um, um, I'm working on a pretty easy one now that I think of it. <laughs> there's, there's, there's some work we're doing about, or, around uh, figuring out if people that were in matches or games that other people were cheating at, what, you know, we, we kind of, the two sides of it, you want to find the cheaters, but you want to find the people that um, weren't cheating and make sure that, um, you know, is, is there, do we find them like quitting? Do we know that that's, the cheating is making them unhappy to the point where they rage quit, stop playing the game? So that's really more important to us than, than the people cheating. So that's a really hard problem. Um, we're doing some stuff, new stuff with the, the, the new title, Advanced Warfare, um, has some real complexities uh, in, in terms of it, it's, it's going to be very different, a very different Call of Duty game in terms of how the weapons work and we're trying to work with